Good evening. Welcome to Wednesday night. I appreciate Michael getting this done on, on for us on Wednesdays and also making sure that we're broadcast live on Facebook on Sunday morning. So I want to encourage you to encourage your friends, family, whoever. They may not be able to get out, but they can tune in on the Internet and watch us. And we'd love to have them be a part of it. Be sure and type in and let us know who you are so we'll have a record of those that are watching. This evening, I want to speak for just a few moments on no hope. You know, maybe you've been watching the Democratic Convention and maybe you've been listening to, to the Republicans and the Democrats, and, you know, they're about as far apart as you can possibly be from the North to the South Pole. Well, and the title of my message is No Hope, because sometimes when you listen to all this political rhetoric, you just think there's no hope. Nobody can fix anything. We've been in a series of sermons on Wednesday nights in Exodus called Delivered to Dwell. And this evening, I want to look at chapter 5 and 6. So if you have your Bibles close by, I'd like for you to follow along with us. Um, I won't be reading all the text because we're taking two chapters. Um, there are times when it seems too difficult to have any hope. And maybe you've been there. And in particular, it seems too hard to trust God and how to trust God in the midst of difficult circumstances. What do we think in these situations? What goes through our mind? And as we experience our own suffering and see it around us, we may wonder if God can be trusted. This text shows us that, that we can trust God when life is hard because the, the Egyptians had put the Israelites under such great bondage that life was almost unbearable. In the chapter before this, we see Moses and Aaron, and they were obedient to God. They performed signs before Israel, and Israel believed God, and they trusted that God would deliver them, that God would do what he said he would do. And now in these chapters, nobody trusts God like this anymore. Not one person, not Pharaoh, not Israel, not Moses, and yet while not no one believes in God, is working for their good. They just think God's letting us just do whatever we want to do. He's allowing all this to happen, that he's not doing what's good for us. But that doesn't stop God from doing what he needs to do. He keeps on with his purpose, and he shows great patience to the people here. I'm so thankful God has patience with us here. I'm thankful God has patience with me. So this shows us in chapter 5 and 6 that when things get worse before they get better, and everyone is tempted to think God will not be faithful. God proves himself through this. Sounds like the political system we have today. And this gives us hope in the midst of our circumstances. We always have hope holding on to the promises of God expectantly. Truth of the matter is, though, things often get worse before they get better. And when uh, circumstances get harder, our hearts have a tendency to get harder. And when things aren't getting better, we become bitter. It's easy to go from being better to bitter. And God gives himself to us in this text to give us hope in his promises and the reasons to trust him through difficult times. These are difficult times with COVID. These are difficult times with a, a presidential election coming up. And we, when we move through this text, we walk through one statement. When life becomes harder and Israel becomes bitter, God still remains faithful and God remains gracious. So when life becomes harder with COVID-19 and when life becomes harder because of the political fighting back and forth and who's right and wrong, God remains faithful and God remains gracious to us. So let's look at it tonight. Number one, worse before better. Um, chapter 5 begins with this little word, afterward. What is this following? What took place? God just called Moses to be Israel's deliverer. Immediately before this, Moses and Aaron came to the people of Israel and they told them the plan. And in chapter 4 and verse 30, the people believed and they, were, and they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction and they bowed their heads and worshiped. Now listen, after this, Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh. The plan is unfolding, but things don't turn out exactly as they expected. For Moses and Aaron pass on God's message to Pharaoh in chapter, I mean in verse 1 of this chapter and said, Let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Now listen to Pharaoh's response. Who is the Lord? 
Now, remember I told you last week the world's three greatest questions, and I said Moses had to deal with three great questions? Well, at the burning bush, who am I? Who am I, Moses had to ask. Who am I to go? And now, when he goes to Pharaoh in chapter 5, the second greatest question in Moses' life, who is the Lord? Who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know Yahweh, and for moreover, I will not let Israel go. Now, this indication of what will become clearer as the story unfolds, the real issue is Israel versus Egypt. Is it's not Moses versus Pharaoh, so don't get mixed up there. It is Pharaoh versus God. Pharaoh has enslaved Israel, but God calls them my people. God is claiming ownership over Israel. I am so thankful because of the cross and what Jesus Christ did that I'm a child of God, that I am considered my people when he speaks of it. Pharaoh says Yahweh is nothing to him. Pharaoh refuses to obey and actually does the opposite. You know, we live in a world today where people deny God all the time and they do just the opposite. We live in a world today where people acknowledge God and they do just the opposite. Rather than f uh, freeing them, he presses them even further down. He makes their working conditions even harder. They used to receive straw for many bricks. And now they don't have it. They have to go out and get their own straw. And when they fail, they're beaten. And the deception of the situation in that follows fits what we know historically from this time period. There's a leather scroll from about 1300 BC that describes a quota of 80,000 bricks for 40 men in one day. That's a lot of bricks. If they work for 12 hours straight, that would be an average of 20 bricks per person. And the scroll goes on to say that none of the 40 men reached the quota. So beatings were probably handed out accordingly. Can you imagine? Every day you can't make your quota and so you're beaten. And then the next day you have to go up and do the same thing again. And when you don't make your quota, you're beaten again. This would have been a desperate situation for them. They've been at this for, for centuries, and now without any hope of relief, they find themselves under more pressure. When all the Israelite fathers had to wake up to new aches and pains each morning in order to spend yet another long, back-breaking day at work on Pharaoh's buildings. Now, the kids knew they were going to do just as their fathers had did and just as their grandfathers had, had done, and their sons were doomed. So as you're working there, you're thinking, this is what my kids are going to inherit. They're going to inherit what I have. Obviously, this would have been no picnic for the mothers at home who somehow had to make it all work out with their husbands. Now, I see a pattern, but this is often how God works. After this hope of deliverance, things get worse, not better. It seems that God is either delaying. He's delaying deliverance, or they may wonder it's not going to happen at all. You know, that's the way it is in our life sometimes when we're praying and asking God to do something to intervene, and it seems like there's a delay. And sometimes when we're asking God to deliver us from this certain situation or these circumstances, it seems like God's not doing anything. And then what happens in our mind, we don't go boldly to, the throne of, uh, boldly to the throne of God. What happens is we begin to think in our mind, it's not going to happen, and we quit asking. Abraham, this happened to Abraham. God promised to give Abraham a son, and you know what happened? He went to the handmaiden, and he had a son. He couldn't wait. It would be through this son that a great nation would come, the nation that became Israel, but Abraham had, and Sarah didn't have any children and were past childbearing years. And Abraham had to wait and trust. And you know, this also happened in the life of Joseph. He was sold into slavery, then put into prison in Egypt. His life was hard for years. He trusted God, and yet the circumstances continued to escalate downward in a downward spiral. And this pattern sounds like the first generation of Christians. Jesus had come. He accomplished their salvation through the death and resurrection, and then he left them. But he left them with the promise of his return. 
The Christians were hopeful and the suffering of this world would be removed when Jesus returned. But even then, things started to get worse. They were faithfully obeying Jesus, the command to tell others about him, and the response was often not positive. This is where we live today. We're waiting for the return of Christ. And you can see how we, how we, how we have continually slid down the hill in our morals and our ethics and in our commitment to the Lord and in our faithfulness to the Lord. The things of God have continued to be pushed back. We continue to, to try to make everybody else's beliefs co-equal with the God that created the whole world, to make everybody's beliefs co-equal with Christian beliefs or uh, Judaism. We've tried to encompass to be something for everybody, yet at the expense of our faithfulness to our own Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Some of these were imprisoned in the New Testament. Some of them were killed, and this stretched forth for decades. I like what Peter said. Peter wrote to the Christians toward the end of his own life in 2 Peter 3, 4. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning, and things had gotten worse for these Christians. And we are still in this situation today. Can't you see? how we have continually spiraled down. Many Christians feel uncertain about their future. It may, it may feel like things are moving from bad to worse, and we can hear the question in our minds, where is the promise of the coming of the Lord? I thought God would, wouldn't want things to be this way. Why would God allow this to happen? Why would God allow us to continue to escalate down? This is how our lives often seem. Sometimes circumstances go from bad to worse. We feel uncertain about the days ahead. We recognize that we don't have control over the future. Like Israel, we see things getting harder as we wait for future deliverance. This is a prime example of where we are today. So, you know, as I look at this and I begin to, to look at this, worse before better. Now notice this, worse to bitter. Bitter emotion. And so as life gets harder, Israel becomes bitter, 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 bitter. We see this in verse 15, verses 15 through 23. The four men of Israel go to Pharaoh to protest this new legislation. Pharaoh accuses them of making this up in order to take a break, and he blames it on Moses. And guess what? They blame Moses. Moses blames God. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that? We point the finger. I mean, just listen to the politicians today. We blame that one. We blame this one. They blame everything on the president now. And, and that's just the way it is. You blame everything on the leader. And who does the leader have to blame? Moses blames God. In verse 22, listen to what he says. Oh, Lord, why have you done evil to these people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to the people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Moses has lost his trust in God. God's not coming through on his word. God's promised deliverance isn't there, and it's not happening. And God's promised blessings are not there. And it's a feeling like they're, they're cursed. God promised relief and left keeps getting harder. It's a problem of evil. If God is all-powerful and all-good then suffering wouldn't be here. That's what we think. If God was what he says he is or proclaims to be, then we wouldn't have suffering. Folks, listen, God never promised that we would, wouldn't have suffering here. He just promised he would walk every day with us. He promised that he would, he would be with us, that we wouldn't be alone. What he promised on the other side would be no suffering, no heartache, and no pain. Since suffering is here, God must either not be all-powerful that is, he must not really be able to overcome suffering. Or he must not be all good. That is, he can't help us, but he just doesn't want to. And that's not good. That was the mentality of Israel. For Israel, either God is not able to deliver them or he doesn't really love them. He is either not powerful or not good. So Moses and Israel get bitter. They complain. They murmur. They whine. Sound like today? Always murmuring and whining? Well, the implications, we know what this is like. 
We live with the promise that God will make all things new, but all things are not yet made new. We live with the promise of Jesus' coming, but it's been over 2,000 years since Jesus walked this earth. We live with the assurance that God will heal us and will in the new creation, uh, we, but we still suffer. You know, this idea of living and having this assurance that God's going to heal us and we'll do this in the new creation, the new life that we have after we leave this life, we may even find that as we trust and obey Christ, things don't get easier, they actually get harder. We may find that we try to help someone and they reject us all the more. We may find that as we try to sacrifice for someone, they accuse us of being selfish. Many Christians around the world find identifying as Christians invites mockery and it invites uh, sarcasm. It invites um, imprisonment. It invites persecution. The persecuted church is suffering greatly in the world today and it is as a result of being faithful to God and trusting in his promise. You know, sometimes maybe when things are going really good for us, maybe we're not as faithful as we need to be. Peter's reminder to those who wonder why God delays. Listen to what he says in 2 Peter 3, verse 8 and 9. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You and I are impatient. Our timetable isn't the same as God's timetable. And he also adds in a different way. And you might not see what God is doing in this and that, but look to God, trust him, even though you can't see what he's doing. God is up to something that we may not understand. We don't understand our circumstances. We don't see what good may come from this. We don't see God doing something good in the trouble around us, but that may be the very thing God uses to develop our faithfulness and our commitment. God is always doing thousands of things that we're unaware of, and we often don't see them. And listen, we sure don't understand them. It doesn't make sense to us. We need to remember that God is like a doctor. He may, he may hurt us in order to heal us. He may, we may hurt before it gets better. Nevertheless, it makes it difficult. And this is what the people were experiencing. They were, they were put under heavy bondage. They had to go get their own straw where the straw had been supplied for them. The quota stays the same, but they have to go out and round up more straw to make brick. I think you could say this. We often have a hard time of trusting God because we don't know him as we should know him. We don't trust his heart because we forget what his heart is really like. So chapter 6, we see wisdom of God's goodness is a blessing. Now, God makes several statements here, and I think it's important these statements be looked at. It gives us a cluster of words and an idea that God uses to describe what the Exodus is all about. And they end up being ideas that will get repeated throughout the rest of the Bible. The words used to describe the Exodus end up being the world's um, words that are used to describe our salvation. Exodus gives us this language of the gospel here. We see five words that will become certainly important for understanding who God is and how he saves us through Jesus. You know, when I think about the world and some of the words that they have, we use in our world today in the religious terms, we use a lot of religious words. Redemption. You know, we talk about redemption and yet we leave out the important part. When we talk about redemption, we leave out the important part that it's not what we do, it's what he did. He redeemed us. 
and sometimes we use real churchy words and the average person who is not in church and who doesn't know the Lord oftentimes becomes confused by this religious terminology. terminology. The words that are used here, this is the vocabulary of the gospel, not just the vocabulary of the Exodus, but the vocabulary of our own independent salvation. God's name and identity expressed through redemption. But before we get to these, there's something that we need to look at. The text is not just about how God is going to save Israel. It is about God himself. Everyone wants to know if there is a God, what is he really like? And we have this question today, is the God of Christians the same as the God of other religions? Is the God that Christians worship the same as other religions? Who is God really? Is Allah God? And what is he really like? And this text touches the heart of this. It tells us something important about how we're to know God. We know who he is most clearly through how he saves. Here's how we see this. This text is about what it means to know God's name. God begins this message to Moses by saying, I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. And verse 3, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, the Lord Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. There's a difference between how the forefathers of Genesis knew God on the one hand and on the other hand how Moses and Israel are about to know God. What are the differences? I ought to pique your interest. Well, it has to do with understanding God's name. The key to understanding this is knowing that the Hebrew idea of someone's name is not just how to pronounce a word. In the Bible, someone's name tells us something fundamentally about who they are. God's name tells us what God is like. So this isn't so much that these forefathers didn't know to call God Yahweh. They seemed to have that done. They knew him more by the name God Almighty, which is, the, which is El Shaddai, the all-powerful one. They knew God's great power. Although they knew to call God Yahweh, they didn't yet understand the significance. See, the point of Exodus is to show them what that means. God is going to show them who he really is. He's going to show them what he's really like. And he's going to show them what his name Yahweh really means. Some noted that we need to, to, to do here is connect this to what immediately follows. For instance... God says he is now revealing his name, Yahweh, and then he goes on to make these statements about redeeming himself. Just notice, I am the Lord, which is I am Yahweh. Three times here in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end, and everything in between is filling out what that means. It is revealing who he really is. This means that there is a knowledge of God that we understand. There's a knowledge of God that will be revealed only as a result of experiencing redemption. Without the great act of redemption, God isn't known as he could be known. You don't know God unless you know him as the God who redeems you. So this is about God's character. It's about his nature. He is the redeemer, and he can only be rightly known as God who delivers. So what I'm saying is there are some people that say they know God. In the New Testament, it's, it says in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that do the will of my Father who is in heaven. So to know God is to know him intimately and personally. To know him is to know and to see what he's doing in your life. To understand where you've been and understand where you're going. Notice in these verses here, I also established my covenant in verse 4 with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, 
I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you as an, with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Now, these verses give us this vocabulary of the gospel, and it is through this idea that we learn about Israel's exodus. We learn about our salvation in Christ. We learn about God's nature. In verses 4 and 5, God says he established this covenant with Abraham. This covenant promised Abraham three things, a people, a place, and a blessing under God's rule. It's part of God's plan to reverse the curse from the Garden of Eden with, with Adam and Eve. And it restored all the things through Christ who would come through as Abraham's line. God's covenants are central to how God moves this plan, his plan and this plan of redemption alone. In fact, they form the backbone of the Bible. They form the actual gospel story of Scripture. They each build on one another until they come to this climax, to this pinnacle. And God says to us now in Jesus, I have committed myself to you in the new covenant. My son has given his blood for you. You can trust that I am committed to your good. Now, I think that's important. It's a word of covenant. It's a covenant between us and God. And then I see the word freedom. In verse 6, I will bring you from out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them. Israel's under the weight of slavery. They are enslaved to a bad master. And God delivers them from, their, from, the, from there, the exodus, and he delivers all who trust in Christ in a new exodus. See, God frees us not only from the penalty of sin, but also from the enslaving power of sin. See, listen, as Christians in Christ, we no longer have to worry about the penalty of sin, nor do we have to be enslaved to the power of sin. Jesus said that anyone who sins is a slave to sin, and he came to give us freedom from its power. In our suffering, and this delay of full salvation, God says, I set you free. The prison door has been opened. Christians, this is a reason for encouragement. This ought to be shouting words that we are free from sin. We're free from the penalty and we're free from the bondage from the power of it. So you have a covenant between man and God. We have a covenant with Jesus Christ. You have freedom. They were freed from the Egyptians' bondage with the taskmasters of making all of these bricks that they couldn't possibly make. We are free through the blood of Christ. We are set free. Our sins have been paid for through his innocent blood, and we are free from the power of sin. Then in verse 6, And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. The redemption is about restoring someone back to their original condition. For Israel, it's about restoring them back to their original state of freedom. The word is also used in a similar context. If someone becomes imprisoned and sells themselves into slavery, a relative can act as a redeemer and purchase them back. He can pay for them to come out of slavery. He redeems them. Now, this is a part of the vocabulary of the gospel. For in Colossians 1.13, He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and trans us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is about deliverance and a new exodus. Israel was transferred from the domain of Pharaoh and transferred to become a new kingdom. Now listen, folks, this is good news. And now through Jesus, we are transferred from the domain of spiritual darkness and are brought into the son's kingdom. And this is what happened when you became a Christian. You were transferred. Ephesians 1.17 says, In Christ we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Redemption comes through His blood. In the Exodus, 
their redemption will, re will come through the Passover lamb being sacrificed for them. In our greater exodus, it comes through a greater sacrifice. It comes through the sacrifice of Christ. I see one more word. It's in verse 7. And I will take to you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. God makes us his own. The word is adoption. This phrase reverberates throughout history at this point, and God will once again say this when he brings a new creation. On the last page of the Bible we read, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And it's why we were made to be with God and to have him as our God. This is our future in Jesus Christ. The literal wording here is more explicit. It doesn't just say, I will take you to be my people. It says, I will take you to myself as a people. This is about being brought to God. This is the goal of the gospel. For Peter said, Christ suffered once for our sins, the righteousness for the unrighteousness, that he might bring us to God, 1 Peter 3.18. God doesn't just declare us righteous. He makes us a part of the family. We become family. You know, I didn't originally see this, but I... I see it now as I'm looking at this. God gives us a home. In verse 8, God promises to bring them into the land of Canaan. Now, I know that's just a land. And in light of the story of the Bible, we learn that Israel's home in Canaan was never their final home for God's people. It was a picture of something greater, the whole earth. The land looked ahead to this new creation where the whole renewed earth would be our home. Canaan was called Israel's inheritance. You know, we have a greater inheritance in Jesus Christ. We have the new creation to come, and the point is we have a home. This is Israel's gospel story. They had a covenant relationship with God, and he had promised to give them freedom from bondage, redemption to himself, adoption as sons and daughters, and an inheritance with himself. That should sound real familiar to those of you that are Christians. God's nature revealed through the gospel. I want to come back to that point for just a moment. This doesn't just show us what it means to be saved. This shows us the character of God. God is showing his name, what he's like. He's saying, your forefathers didn't know me like you will know me because you will find out who I am by experiencing redemption. You know, salvation should make a change in our life. It ought to change the want-tos in our life. It ought to change our heart. It ought to produce a desire to want to spend time with Him, to spend time in His Word, to spend time with His people, to be active in church, to be a part of a family of God. You know, I know we've been separated with the COVID, but you know, we can be together through Zoom, through Facebook, through, through text messaging, through emails, through phone calls, conference calls, there's ways for people to connect. God doesn't reveal himself anywhere as clearly as he does in redemption. Jesus showed himself to us. God showed Israel who he really was by how he delivered them and how he made them his own. He is the God who keeps his covenant. He is the God who keeps his promise. He is the God who keeps his word. He is the God who gives freedom. He is the God that sets us free from bondage. He is the deliverer God who redeems by blood. We are saved through blood. They had to have a lamb, a scapegoat. They had to make a sacrifice for their sins. We have Christ, the lamb of God that made a once and for all sacrifice. And that adopts us into the family and he gives us an inheritance. We get a new name. We're now called Christian. We have a new home and our home is not here. Our home is in heaven. He has done this even more greatly in the New Testament. It shows us that we can really know God. And it also shows us <coughs> that apart from Christ, we can't know God. It's a great gospel story for us to apply to our lives. Last but not least, 
Behold, our God is faithful. The last from verse 9 to 30. When life gets harder and we become bitter, God remains gracious. And finally, God remains faithful. Moses didn't respond well. Israel has not responded well. And God gives this message of assurance for Moses to tell Israel. Now, how do both of them respond? We see both of their responses, and in each case, we see God's continued faithfulness. <laughs> God's continual grace, graciousness. In verse 9, Moses spoke, Thus the people, but they, said, they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. They still can hardly believe. And notice why. Because of their circumstances, they are not able to trust God in the midst of this. In their mind, their problems are bigger than their God. But look at verse 10. So the Lord said to Moses, here is a clear response to their unbelief. So in this response, go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. He doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't leave them. He says, okay, let's go ahead and do this. He goes right back to, Moses goes right back to thinking about himself and his own inadequacy. And he says, the people won't listen to me, Lord. And he seems to allude to, to his speech problems again. Lord, I, 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 can't, I can't do this. I don't have the eloquence of speech. I, I'm, I'm not very persuasive in my speech. I'm not very articulate in what I've got to say. I have a limited vocabulary. I'm insecure. I have a, 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 a my voice changes. I just can't do this. Now notice how God responds to Moses. Same as before. Verse 13. He simply reminded Moses and Aaron about their charge to rescue Israel. Nobody in this entire chapter believes God. Pharaoh doesn't acknowledge him. The Israelites complain and won't listen. Moses complains and keeps on giving excuses. And through all of this, God keeps moving his plan to bless them ahead. And in face of their unfaithfulness, he remains faithful. And in the face of their excuses, he remains steady. The rest of the chapter demonstrates this commitment. The genealogy here is Aaron's line. It stretches backward and forward from Aaron. God has this all planned out, and Aaron is going to be the priest of for Israel and the excuses of everyone else isn't going to stop God's plan. Now let me just come back. God told Moses to tell this to the people. They're complaining. Moses is complaining. So God gives them a renewed vision of himself through his promises. This is what we need. This is what God gives us. When you're suffering, when you're confused, when you're not sure what's going on in life, when you're not sure what is coming tomorrow, when you're not sure of how you'll make it, when you're stricken with grief, when you wonder if anything's going to get better, this is what God says. Remember the benefits of the gospel. Remember these words. Remember my promises. I made a covenant with you to do good. I have freed you from your sin of death and I have redeemed you. I have made you my own and I have promised an inheritance. And most importantly... He calls their attention to his promises. He's calling attention to himself. This is about God himself, who is and what he's like, and it's not about abstract ideas of grace or redemption. It's about God. Listen, I will bring you out. I will deliver you. I will redeem you. I will make you, uh, take you to myself. I will be your God. I will bring you into the land. I will give it to you. Jesus has not only done this, but we... But we get them by being united to him. That's how we get there. This is a lesson on how we help one another through hard times. I hope this has been beneficial to you this evening and that you do dive into the book of Exodus and you do look at the symbolism and you look at the truth there and you see that you know through Christ we do have an Exodus and that maybe you come to the place, if you're just surfing the Facebook and you run across this, just know that God loves you. 
He has a plan and purpose for your life. He sent Christ into the world to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, to pay for our sin debt so that you and I could be right with God. I want to encourage you, if you've never given your life to Jesus, to do that today. I want to encourage you, if you are complaining and whining and going through all these difficult times, trust God. God is faithful. God is faithful to his word. God's faithful to his people. God will be faithful. So let us be faithful to him. God bless you. Thank you for being with us.